introduce yourselves for your names. Hey, I'm Jonathan Boardman. Hey, I'm Brian Yaki. And then I wanted to let you know how lucrative it is. Both first placers won $1,100. That'll pay for a lot of books. <laughs> Take it away. All right. Um, so yeah, so our project was on analyzing and forecasting gun violence in Georgia. And uh, just before we get started about what we did, I just wanted to give a side note on what made this project so difficult. The vast majority of our time was actually spent putting data together, which is anyone who's in stats is going to tell you that's, that's a huge part of the job. But here in particular, it's bad because gun violence in general, while there, there's a lot of rhetoric and, and that's probably a, a large part of what's you know, stifling research in that area, another even bigger one is almost kind of ironic. In this age of big data, it's really hard to get gun violence data. If, if you if you want to get it, and most of the time it's going to come in some sort of aggregated form, like some sort of like yearly aggregate, and you really can't do any effective modeling with that. Now, this thing called the Gun Violence Archive came about in 2013, and it's really helped to mitigate some of these problems, and they've, they've compiled all these incidents across the United States together in one place. But the problem is the interface is still extremely clunky, and once again, it's not that old, so there's still really not that much data. And Brian is going to give you a little bit of info behind how we actually assembled this data set and then some of our preliminary investigations. So there you go. Well, when we started out, we did get our data from the gun. Well, we actually started out with a bunch of data sets that we that didn't work out. So we ended up scraping our, or getting our data off of the uh, GVA website, but we could only get it about 500 observations at a time. So that meant we could get about a month or two in some of the less active months data at a time. And we ended up with 33 different CSVs that we had to stitch together. Um, we had two big goals uh, through this. So we wanted to investigate regional and temporal patterns in monthly gun violence incidents in Georgia between 2014 and 2017 inclusive. And then we were going to develop a lag regression model for forecasting the monthly gun violence incident counts in the metro Atlanta region uh, defined in the data set assembly section uh, using temporal uh, temporarily prior regional count data. So what we did was we got these 33 different CSVs and we stitched them all together and they had some pretty terrible location variables. We ended up with three variables. We had state, which we knew we were all inside of Georgia. We had city or county, which is pretty inconsistent. And then we had address. And the addresses were a mess as well. It could say anything from a, an actual street address with a street and a number or 400 block of Johnson. And what we did with those is we wanted to condense down into these regions. So we stitched all those together. We entered them to a Google Maps scrape. We did about 10,000 Google Maps scrapes in just a little bit over an hour to bring back all of the location data for every single incident. And out of that, we extracted the zip codes. Now, the first three digits of your zip code is called your SCF. It's your central facility code. Central sectional. 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 Facility code. Yeah. Anyway. SFC. Yeah, S whatever. yeah anyway. Close. So <laughs> what we did was, if when you look at those, all of those create 19 different disjoint regions in Georgia. So from those, we collapsed everything down based on cultural similarity and geographical proximity into these eight regions. And then from these eight regions is where we did a lot of our different analysis. And um, at first, we did, uh, the top box plot, what we did was we looked at the monthly counts across the years for the different regions. And it, it came out exactly like we thought. Uh, the two worst were, the right here we have the, the top one on the left is Atlanta itself, and the high uh, blue one over here is actually Metro Atlanta. But those also had the highest um, populations. So what we did was down on the bottom, we took those and we adjusted them for population. So we divided them, we took the population and we did counts per 10,000 individuals. And it was really pretty shocking what we found. Metro Atlanta dropped down to the bottom and Atlanta dropped down to tide with the bottom, and we found a really lot, a high occurrence of incidents through the bottom band of Georgia when populationally adjusted. Yes, now from there, we moved on to some of the prediction and modeling that Jonathan is gonna tell you about. Yeah, so while we can use this approach, actually, let me put this in my collar, it'll probably be better, can you hold me? Here, you got can it? you hear me? Are we good? We're good, cool. Okay, great. All right, you got that? yeah, okay, I think about a pocket here. Yeah. Awesome. So um, while this approach I'm about to go over, this, this regional forecasting using lag regression could be used for any one of these regions, we chose Metro Atlanta, well, one, because it was sort of interesting just based on that initial analysis, and two, I mean, we live here, right? So let's, let's check this out. And anyway, the goal of a lag regression is essentially to, you want to predict the value of some y time series, some y variable, 
based on the values of some x variable. And in this case, both of these are going to be time series. So the goal was to predict the regional monthly counts, uh, gun violence incident counts, in metro Atlanta based on past counts in metro Atlanta and everywhere else in Georgia. So hopefully, you know, we can not only get a good model, but maybe get a little bit of insight into what's going on. Now, the big problem is identifying your predictors. What predictors are you going to throw in? First of all, there's a lot of them, right? So when you're doing time series modeling like this, or specifically doing a lagged regression model, every single one of those t, like t minus 1, t minus 2, t minus 3, all the way back, all of those are potential separate predictors. So with eight different regions, if I was looking at 20 time steps back, that's, that's a large number of predictors. And on top of that, a lot of them are going to be moving together a lot of these different time series are going to be moving together, not because there's any sort of causal relationship, but because there's some, they just happen to be moving together at the same time due to maybe some, you know, confounding, you know, third variable that we're unaware of. So we really wanted to extract some, some causal insight from this. To do this, we looked at cross-correlation functions. So these, these CCFs up here. And what this is telling you, in both cases, we've got a Y variable that's always going to be Metro Atlanta monthly counts. And then we've got our lags of the X variable, which are all of the different um, regions that we're investigating. So this is saying how correlated are the instant counts at some particular time between that y and that x. Well, over here, we, we've got some interesting patterns going on, but like Metro Atlanta with Metro Atlanta, this is, this, is kind of, this is kind of strange. And it turns out what's happening is precisely what I mentioned a minute ago. You've just got these sort of spurious correlations that are, that are popping up. They just happen to be moving in the same direction, and, and you're getting these, these sorts of emergent apparently statistically significant spikes. Now, to get rid of these in common trends, we applied something called pre-whitening. And without going into the details, and if you're really interested, you can, you can look at these steps here. But without going into the details, the idea was to remove the in common trends and then look at the correlation between those residuals. So you model that time series structure, you remove, you remove that, and then hopefully based on what's left over, you can figure out what your significant predictors are. And sure enough, this was Atlanta, for Metro Atlanta, and we go over here, and now suddenly we see, all right, cool, we've got a T minus one lag and we've got a T minus two lag. That makes sense. So gun violence in Atlanta is sort of driving some, some gun violence in Metro Atlanta, or possibly. But if this method is being applied correctly, what do you think we should see with Metro Atlanta versus Metro Atlanta? Well, if we've done, if we've done our, our process correctly, that should remove all of these, these extra correlations. And lo and behold, that's what we see, a single solitary spike at t equals zero. So these residuals are trivially correlated with themselves. So yeah, um, so this allowed us to pick out our predictors. And yeah, this is our final model. So all of the different regions or all the different lags that we found significant are up here. And the model just came out textbook perfect. Like you look at that QQ plot and it's just, it looks like we made it up. But it, I swear we didn't. Yeah, yeah. So that was fantastic. I was worried that by the time we finally built this thing, we'd have to go back and rerun models. And so seeing like wonderful diagnostics just made my day. Um, so we moved straight into you know, evaluating this model. How did it do? Now, I've not shown the test set up here, and that's because it's extremely boring. 2018 was basically a straight line. So uh, unless you like that, you know, this, I thought the training data, the fit to the training data was a little bit more interesting. You see the model actually contoured quite well. Um, and based on the R squared statistics, we can see we're explaining around half the variance in, in these incidents. And at that R squared of like 0.5, that doesn't sound like that much. You guys have been spoiled. You're saying 0 0.8, 0 0.9. If you're in physics, you better hope it's 0 0.999 or something like that. But in other fields, uh, humanities, or say you're working at the CDC, if you can account for a very small amount of that variance, and it's something you can affect, like maybe a flu vaccine accounts for one, two, three percent, I don't know. But if you can actually affect change, right, that's big. That is a big deal. So accounting for 50 percent of the variance is nothing to sneeze at. That's, that's actually pretty impressive. And this was only four years of data. 48 data points for training and testing and validation. So I can only imagine how far we can go if we just get a little bit more data. We could possibly make these models much more fine-grained, not only on a temporal scale, but on a regional scale. Shrink that down to, I don't know, like, like counties or something. And you can allocate resources better. And if it got even you know, more, more well-refined, if we got even more data, who knows, maybe we could even infer a little bit about what's going on and maybe even prevent gun violence incidents in the future.
Thank you. That was our project.